we've put in a panel with some really amazing speakers that have been here before. Um, and we're talking about adaptability because that's what we have to do. And it happens over and over again. I know for me it's happened a lot in the last couple of years. So I think it's a really important and germane topic for us to talk about. Uh, when I was looking up the word adaptability last night, one of the things they were talking about was um, like you need to be curious to be adaptable. But one of them was about how you need to have good people around you in order to deal with these different kinds of situations. So the people you're going to see on stage right now are three really good people who said yes, like in a heartbeat, to being able to do this panel with us. And I, I think it's going to be a great conversation. Um, <clears throat> but basically, this conversation about adaptability is about dealing with things that come at you, good or bad, right? I mean, like opportunities or challenges or setbacks, and how you deal with that. So <clears throat> I think we'll start on the challenge side first. So I, was, I, think, I think the question is, <laughs> can you talk about a situation where you had a setback, like you had some funding that didn't come through that you thought was going to come through or didn't come through the way you wanted, or you had a client that you lost that you thought was going to be a big challenge, or you had some other kind of thing come at you that sort of either derailed or looked like it was going to derail things, and then how did you deal with that? Yeah, I can start. Um, so first of all, I'm going to... I feel like if I lean back too far, I will just like really sink into this Joe. couch and fall asleep. Oh, so I'm gonna try <laughs> not to do that. I didn't do any introductions. It's okay. I'm just... <laughs> Can you tell people who you are, please? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Horton, and um, yeah, I have the problem that I'm assuming we all have, and that we do a million things. So when somebody asks you to, what do you do, or like to introduce yourself, you're like, well, like this, 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 this. But we'll leave it at rapper for now, just to keep it succinct. Uh, so Joe Horton, rapper. I'm Laura Zabel. I'm the executive director of Springboard for the Arts, and I'm also an actor and performer. I'm Nancy Lyons. Uh, I'm the CEO of Clockwork, which is a local digital agency, and uh, I'm a speaker and a writer and a weirdo. <laughs> which is our favorite kind of person. And I'm, I'm Susan Campion, by the way. Um, <laughs> thank you for doing that. And actually, that like the having multiple things is a pretty universal characteristic, I think, of most of the people in the room. So, so now, Joe, would you tell our story? Challenge. Um, yeah, I can think of one in particular that threw me for a loop. So I did, a, um, I did a, a, an interdisciplinary theater piece, an experimental theater piece that had elements of dance and uh, set design, visual art, a whole bunch of other stuff. And um, we did a demo version of it. And we I had, I had this really lovely dancer um, do the lead role and she was great and we really got along and everything was cool and we were planning the next round the, the actual premiere and probably like six months beforehand which in this time frame is actually a pretty short thing she blew out her Achilles tendon which was horrible for her really really horrible for her she's great now by the way that she she's rehabbed and it's all it's all good um, and I had a kind of a weird situation where I mean what I think it's similar to this where you're, you're you have a, a mix of reactions, like your first reaction is for them, and you're like, you're, you know, this is a, a dancer whose body is being affected, and so I'm, I'm, I had a tremendous amount of uh, sympathy for her and concern for her as a friend, and then I also had a, an issue that popped up as a result of that that I had to, to scramble and figure out what to do, and that thing taught me a really important lesson, which was just never panic, ever. Like, panic is just never a good thing. It never helps you figure out something. So I, I think part of adaptability is over time building up this, um, what feels like a reflexive relaxation when something bad happens. Um, and that skill, like, over the course of my life, that skill has popped up in a personal setting, like with personal tra tragedies and certainly professional ones as well. And I was able to find somebody else to do it, and she was equally great, and it worked out well. Um, but there was, a, there was maybe a sleepless night or two <laughs> in there. Yeah, uh, I mean, when I, when I think about that idea of setbacks that turn into opportunities, in some ways it feels like, oh, well, everything we do is because of some <laughs> feedback from the world that that doesn't exist, or it's not how things are, and we want to make it different. Um, but a specific... Uh, time that that happened that I think I learned a lot from 
in terms of how our, we work now. When I, when I first started at Springboard, which was like 12 years ago, um, the organization was really teeny tiny and really, uh, I came in and the mandate was like, you gotta do some stuff. The organization needs to do new things. Um, and we did this big survey and of artists about what they needed and this was obviously pre-Affordable Care Act and all that and, and artists said they needed health care. And in fact, they were twice as likely to not have health insurance as the general population. And so we had this like mandate to do something <laughs> new and a very clear answer about what people wanted us to do. Um, and the only path that I knew from like looking at other nonprofits was, oh, you're supposed to go get money to do that. So I took my little survey results and I went and met with all of these funders and I said, we're gonna do something about health insurance. And they were all like, that is very important. You are never going to be able to do anything about that. Um, and no one would give me any money to, to do that. So uh, we took $200 um, <laughs> and started a very, very tiny pilot program um, with Neighborhood Involvement Program, which is a community clinic in Uptown. Um, and from that little partnership and that little investment, we learned what worked and we learned that people wanted that and we learned that we could make stuff kind of out of nothing if we had good partners and if we found the right people to work with. Uh, and then we were able to go back to funders and other people like that and say, see, look, we are doing something. It works, people want it. Um, and that helped me learn that that's the way we should always be making things, that I never want to be asking for money first. I always want to be making sure that something is useful and relevant and works in the world. And then it's way easier to attract people to support it or to engage with it. Um, and I feel like that's become now this sort of process and pattern that we use at Springboard whenever we want to do something new um, that was totally born out of trying to figure out what the hell we were going to do with all those closed doors and the magnitude of a giant um, health insurance system and $200, uh, but has served us well in a bunch of other contexts, too. Um, so I think as an entrepreneur, uh, every success that I've ever had has been born out of some massive failure. Um, and, I, and I think part of it is um, just, you know, having a willingness or a tenacity or or a willingness to persevere regardless is, is like super important um, because every year we lose clients and every year, and, and that, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, I always tell people that part of our job is to dash your dreams and, um, you know, because I think that most service businesses um, grew up in a culture where the customer was always right. But if you work in technology, the customer is not always right. So telling the truth can lose you a client. And yet that's a core value of ours. And so every year we find ourselves pivoting and scrambling to learn new things and compete in new and better ways. And simply by virtue of the fact that we work in technology, we are... Um, we are uh, pressed with being consistently intellectually curious and learning things so that we're on the front of um, what our clients are going to need from us. I think um, one of the biggest challenges in my entrepreneurial life was the recession, um, which is you know, really interesting because when you talk to a millennial, um, they have no idea how much their lives have been shaped by what happened in 2008 and 2009, but it changed our economy for ever, maybe, because we look at things differently. And when, um, in, in 2008, uh, we were growing, we had recently moved into a new building, we had committed ourselves financially, and at the end of that year, we had a major client back out of a significant amount of work for the coming year. And um, of course we had to go and do what we always do, which is find new clients, fill that pipeline. But what we also did, was because we have a culture of transparency and because we are absolutely committed to our values, we had conversations with the people that we worked with, with the people that are on staff at Clockwork. And I said, you know, we could do what every other agency in town does and we can lay you off because we have lost an account. Or we can all put our arms around each other and take a pay cut. And that's what we did. So in 2008, I took half pay and my staff took 25% pay cut. 
and, um, and we made it through a recession and nobody lost their jobs. And, um, and it's one of the best lessons I've ever learned and it's one of the best things we ever did because nothing increases engagement more than the truth. And every employer on the planet is trying to figure out how to engage their staff, but the truth will set you free. Um, so. You guys are good at adaptability. <laughs> um, I mean, for the questions, for everything. But uh, yeah, and now Nancy's also sought after for talking about how to engage your employees and, and be, talk about culture, build a culture around that too. So yeah. it's an interesting thing. You made me also realize that Giant Steps is actually born of the recession and an adaptability story too, because same, my consulting business basically went to zero in the recession. And we weren't looking at it as an answer to that, but I know that for me, it felt really good to be creating and building something during a time when everything else was just so depressing and there wasn't any money. So there are, there are like things that, you know, different types of things that can come out of that. I want to follow on like with what you said, Joe, about like the point of reflection and, and calm. I think that's really important. And I'd like any of you to talk about, you know, when those things hit, even if they're professional things, I feel like there's also like your own personal reaction to that, right? Because as a leader, you're leading other people perhaps, and like you were too, we all, you, you all had other people dependent on you for the things that you were talking about. Um, but you also have your own like process that you have to go through. So can you explain or talk a little bit about that and maybe how that's changed for you over time? Yeah, so this, is, it, th this might seem like a strange turn here, but I, I really feel like all fear basically roots down to a fear of death and a fear of life, a fear of being alive and a fear of death. And so I, I've come to this, this, this place where I'm, I'm really, I really realize that in order for me to live well in the world, I have to be constantly confronting my own mortality and also understanding that it's okay, that, e that being alive is, is okay. And there's, there is this awakening that happens as a part of you that if you don't, instead of like disacknowledging death and life and sort of numbing and distracting and pushing down, which frankly, like our world is just so concerned with that. Like the whole, everything, like that's what we're slanging really. Like we're not selling like, you know, iPods and, and you know, soda. We're selling um, this m immortality myth really. So I'm like, yeah, I'm done with that. I'm done with that. Like, I'm going to humble myself to the actuality of my existence at all costs, no matter what. And I feel like that's a, that's a real, that's felt like a very radical action to me. You know, like, it, it's like, the, I, I feel we all have this, like, like activist, like, just what do we do about that asshole? Like, <laughs> like and I'm like, I, just the most powerful thing that I've come to with that is just acknowledging what is happening and undressing it of its illusions. And so, I, to me, once, you, once that can happen or even begin to happen, I'm not saying every day is like a Shangri-La, like rainbow dance or whatever, but once you even begin to do that at all, then when problems come up, they seem kind of whatever. It's like, it, it's all good, because if you, if you can confront that, like, the, that death can tap you at any time and you don't know what it is, then, then when, just and anything else just really pales in comparison to that. It really does. And it's not that it's trivialized in a way, its significance actually can emerge from that. And the beauty of life can actually come to the forefront and you can meet it with your awareness. Um, so I, that's, to me, it'll always boil down to that. Like, no matter what, I always go back to that where I'm like, it can be dressed a million different ways, but that's what it's about. Thank you. Yeah, I sort of have two competing ideas that I want to share. Uh, one of them is that I, I feel like because it's giant steps and, and we need to be real, I want to just acknowledge that I do a fair amount of like waking up in the middle of the night freaking out. Um, <laughs> That's why we're friends. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when something goes wrong or something, you know, is unexpected or there are those setbacks or failures, I worry a lot. <laughs> um, and I think maybe as I've gotten older and as I've done the work longer, I've gotten better at compacting that anxiety cycle. Some water just fell out of the oh, ceiling. No. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll scoot back a little. <laughs> um, Who knows what we're going to have to adapt to? <laughs> um, I'm afraid of death. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't uh, get your cord uh. too close to the puddle. Um, 
So that, that cycle maybe happens faster. I don't spend as much time like sitting in the worry before I can get to the doing or the action. But it doesn't mean that that goes away or it doesn't mean that I don't still um, have the capacity to wind myself up about some really dumb small thing. Uh, and then the other idea, which is I think so important about what Joe just said is that, that um, is that humility and the sort of awareness of the, especially when you're talking about work and work that maybe is intensely personal to you, um, but in the grand scheme of things uh, in the world, um, you know, that sort of constant reminder that like maybe no one else cares as much as you do. Sometimes at Springboard I'll say, uh, this work is, I want it to be the most important work that all of us are doing and this is not the CIA. <laughs> like, whatever happens here today, no one's going to die. <laughs> like, we're not going to cause a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> so let's find a happy balance between those two ideas, that these things are important and urgent, and we very rarely in arts nonprofits are in a life and death situation. <laughs> um. <laughs> There's a... This is a guy up there looking at the room. Um, okay, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I can. Yeah, it was about the, the personal processing when you're dealt some of those setbacks. So, and also as a leader, yeah. right? So you have to like go through your own whatever. Yes. And then you also have people that probably are influenced by how you go through that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, now I can answer this question. Uh, now that I know what it is. Um, so I think it's interesting that, that, that you brought up the getting up in the middle of the night and pan panicking because I would like to meet some, I would love to meet the person in this audience who is never plagued by panic because whomever you are, you should write a book and call it The Secret <laughs> and then marry me because you are on to something. Because uh, uh, I, I have, I, I was just, telling Erica about the panic attacks I was having, you know, in the spring because business was weird after the election and big clients were like, we're just going to wait a while to see if we all die, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, anytime soon before we spend our budgets. And uh, seriously, like, we're just going to see if the world blows up before we sign a contract. Um, meanwhile, small businesses were trying to survive, right? So that the spring was hard. Now we're busy as heck because everybody's like, oh, this is just status quo. Oh, this crazy is just how it's going to be. So we'll just do business. Why don't we just pretend none of that's happening and we'll just do business? So we're busy as hell. Um, but panic attacks and... Like, normal human responses happen to everybody, probably even the CIA, you know? Like, even, it doesn't matter who you are or how far you've come or what Zen tools you've managed to incorporate into your existence or what you've already survived or the lessons you've already taught yourself. Like, we're human, and, and fear is like a gripping thing that you deal with every day, right? A little bit more, like being alive means you just have to keep your fear in check. And to the degree that you're able to do that, you can truly live. Um, for me, uh, growing up in a highly dysfunctional family, <laughs> are you all comfortable? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> growing up in real. a highly dysfunctional family taught me how to compartmentalize. Um, in a way that has served me well. Um, truly, truly. It's like I can, I learned a long time ago to put it here because nothing, no amount of panic or, or, or night terrors is going to change this before tomorrow, you know? And so I do, th and then the other thing is where can I put my energy and my time that relieves my heart? You know, where can I, and so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an activist in the LGBTQ space because if I can't do good at work, I got to do it somewhere or there's no point in waking up. Um, and, and my life is at its best when those two worlds collide and I feel like, you know, there's alignment. But when I can't have the alignment, at least I can focus my energy on some little something that makes a difference. Thank you. That's, yeah, there's, 
like, I have so many things I want to ask you now. <laughs> um, I, I, but I, I'm curious about that too, because even this example with uh, the keynote conversation, like for me, I think based on some of my family background, I'm pretty good at uh, compartmentalizing as well. And, and I'm actually like, I had no concern about what we're gonna do with this time spot, because I can come up with like eight different things that could work in most, most situations, because I think that that's, that's the easier thing for me. And I, I mean, if I spend time in Brazil, they talk about dar um jeito, is like find a way around. So that's like a way of life, sort of a part of the, the, the mentality, I guess. And so I think that that's constantly, you know, living in different situations, maybe speaking the language and not speaking the language, you're, that feels comfortable to me. But sometimes the not processing part of it comes back to bite me, like usually in the middle of the night. Um, I want to pull, uh, go off of a, something you said, kind of. <laughs> but I think we probably talked about before, a different kind of adaptability around if there's ever been a time where you're like really in love with something that you're doing, like an idea or a project or a product or a service, and turns out like maybe nobody else is. And so how do you make that decision about like, do I adapt the thing or do I adapt my approach to it? Do you have any examples of that? Yeah, when I read that question on the list a little bit ago, it made me laugh because I was like, oh, like the, if you ask anyone else at Springboard, the road is littered with things that Laura thought were a good idea. <laughs> it turned out no one else wanted. <laughs> and some things I still really love and bring up over and over again, and people have to tell me like, no, that's really not ever gonna be a thing. Um, <laughs> and sometimes we do those things anyway. Yeah. Like sometimes we think, they are, well, like the healthcare work is a pretty great example of, of something that we knew was important. It was important to the people that we serve and the work we wanted to do. We've been running that healthcare program for almost a decade now, sent thousands, close to 10,000 artists to the doctor. Um, and I have yet to find a funder who thinks that that's really cool. It's just not sexy. Um, and so there's also different audiences or different kinds of, of people that you're trying to engage in that work and like in in the context of a nonprofit getting the sort of um, change that you want to make in the world to align with the kind of market demand for funding like that's a magical thing when those two things come together and and it's a great day but it's pretty rare I mean a lot of times you're sort of figuring out how to how to frame this for these people or how to make this look a little more appealing on this side. Um, so I think it is also about knowing, uh, knowing who, who your real audience is and, and who your purpose is. And, and I think having some radar for when you get that feedback, when is it a time to say, oh gosh, this is not really working, we need to open this back up and try a new way and iterate and do something different. Or when you get that feedback, and, and something inside you knows, no, this is, the world just doesn't quite know it yet, but it, this needs to ha exist. And maybe we need to talk about it differently, or maybe we need to connect it to some other um, audience or some other group of people, but this is still a thing. And I think developing that radar for not being, um, you know, not being obtuse when someone's telling you that, that something is, is not working, uh, but also not being so back on your heels that every piece of feedback you get tells you, oh, well, I guess we'll just give up then. Yeah, I mean, so I feel like, so as an artist, there's kind of a, a stubbornness there that I think serves us well, like those of us, uh, I mean, every, I hate that word, because that's a stupid word, like artist, is though art is some other thing that we all do, but, like in the world of making things for people to, to come and participate in or listen to or whatever. I think that you, you really do have to be resolute in your vision, um, but your vision has to be like, like actual vision. So I, what, I, what I found for myself is that a lot of the feedback that I was getting from other people were things, the, the ones that stung were ones that I knew, like I wasn't making the work of art to make a work of art. I was trying to look cool or something like that. I was like, man, if I say that, they're really gonna be like, yeah, like this is tight. And so, I, it, you know, there is an important process of interacting with people. Like if it's not on the ground level, it's not really doing anything. So, and once you get down to the ground level, like people can really help 
knock you around in a really healthy way. Like, have you all ever heard the concept of samsara? The, it's a, a Buddhist concept, samsara, right? The rock tumbler, like we're all banging against each other. So I want to be in that. Like, I want to knock up against people and I want them to push me and knock off my edges. And then when it comes down to it, when I know, and I always know, when I come up with an idea that I know, I just, there is no doubt in my mind. When that happens, I'm like, wait, wait, how family friendly is this? Because I really want to say fuck so bad. Oh, yeah, you but can I? Yeah. <laughs> there have been plenty of fucks at Giant Steps for a Sweet. long time. Sweet. <laughs> so I'm like, fuck them, you know? Fuck them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, hey, like that. But no, I'm like, one, so once I know, then, then all bets are off. And then if, if, if somebody doesn't like it, I'm like, cool, there are 7 billion people on the planet, and a lot of them are making art, and you can find it elsewhere. And, and, I, and I know that, I, that, yeah, I mean, I guess that's what it boils down to, is like just being, like just being honest with yourself. It's, it's hard to do, but I think trying to do that, no matter what, no matter how successful it is, is important. Well, and I think like that's also interesting to me that sort of balancing between like sometimes you really do need to rethink what you're doing and sometimes the people you're talking to are not your people, right? So trying to figure out which situation in and sometimes also I think all three of you are in this situation like you're ahead of the curve. So then you also have to figure out like is there some education or some other kind of thing that I have to do because there is something there, but it's the regular systems aren't quite set up to, to see it or handle it. Yeah, that is the thing. Cause, so a lot of the work that I do, people, keep, people will say like, no, 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 you're doing this wrong. <laughs> like I, I did a piece, uh, the, the, that theater piece that I talked to was about slavery. And if you went, you could have walked through the whole thing and listened to it and not known that it was actually about that, but it was my interaction with it. It was an honest thing. And the whole time leading up to it, I had friends telling me, no, 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 you have like a platform. You have to say this other thing about slavery. And I was like, I don't want to say that thing. There's other people saying that thing. I want to say this thing about it. But when it was over and when people actually saw the vision come to life, um, many of those same people came up to me and said, thank you for being true to your voice that whole time. And I get it now. And it's not that I wasn't influenced by those people, but I think sometimes you just have to really be like, this is what I can do and this is what I want to do and this is what I'm going to do. Um, and that's okay if it's not the thing you want to have happen. Um, but that, it is tough to hear that over and over again and to stay true to what you're trying to do. And, and I, for me, it's tough to know which one of those situations you're in. Like, I, am I in the situation where I should persevere because it is something and, and people just aren't there yet? Or am, and, you know, do I need to take the feedback and readjust or whatever? Uh, or are they, are they just not my people and I need to find other people? I think we got to make room for mistakes, too. Because even if I had finished that whole process and people were like, nah, I still suck, like, it's okay. Like, I tried an honest try. I gave, you know, I gave it an honest effort, and if I failed, it's all good. You know? I think that's also about cultivating the people around you that you trust to tell you and to call you on your bullshit to be like, oh, if, if, if Susan's saying that to me, then this is not right. Like, you know, having the, that sort of whether you call that like a personal board of directors or just the people that you really trust in the work um, who you can run those ideas by and say, you know, everybody is telling me this isn't right or it's not the right way to do it. What do you think? Do you think we're on to something? Do you think this is a, is this a thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is why I think um, culture at work as a business strategy is of critical importance because I think right now we're all feeling so pressured to do something new and to innovate and to, you know, be forward thinking and to deliver product or services that are on the cutting edge. And there's so much pressure on small business and in industry that um, in, in order to do those things, we've got to be more open to failure. And we are a perfection based society. We want thing, we don't want to deliver something until it's done and it's perfect. But I think technology has put us in a place and artistry has put us in a place where we're recognizing that actually fail, failure or flawed end results are the places where we get our best lessons, but we have to have a culture that allows for that. And I think we don't, we, in our, in our uh, work society, culture is a byproduct of a business plan instead of an intentional thing that you create at the beginning. And I think when we create it and it aligns with our values, and our values are all about supporting that business plan, and we make room for failure, we're also inadvertently or deliberately making room for wild successes because you learn and you grow from every failure. 
Yeah, now I, I want to know why we've never had this conversation before, because there's a lot that we could talk about here. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I think that that learning piece, and, and Laura and I teach together, we talk about that too, about how that has to be built in, like it has to be part of the process. So just like there are other parts of you know systemic issues, there's a systemic thing in business about how culture is supposed to work or how people are supposed to work, um, and that's... Uh, working against us in a lot of cases, especially with accelerated timelines and uh, oh, the way yeah. the world changing. Like if you think about where we were a year ago, Giant Steps, so it was a little earlier in the month, it was the day that the Access Hollywood tape came out. Uh, we had, I know we have people in the room who have been part of the No Dapple stuff, that that was heating up then, right? I mean, if you just think about all the things that have happened in the last year and just absorbing that, but then also trying to like have a life and trying to maybe run a business or have a, an artistic career, that's a lot to absorb at one time. So it's that building the learning into it and trying to even shorten that cycle, I think is really critical to surviving. Well, and also recognizing personal accountability for allowing for that, because I think as leaders or as entrepreneurs, I think we sort of feel like we're going to write a plan and this is the way it's going to be, but I think you have to surround yourself with people and you have to maintain a value you know, that suggests that, I mean, Brene Brown did a lot for vulnerability. We all know the goddess Brene, <laughs> who taught us that crying at work is awesome and you should do it, even, even if you're a dude. Although I've seen more dudes cry at work than women, but whatever, that's another conversation. <laughs> also, also at Giant Steps, actually. Uh, right. <laughs> right? But I, I, I'm intrigued by the idea that we are really set up to bring our vulnerability to work, but we don't talk much about what it means to receive vulnerability, and failure is a vulnerable thing. So how do the people around the failure respond to it, lift it up, use it, and make it something better? That's stuff we don't talk about. We talk about, hey, cry, because that's what Brene, the goddess Brene says you should do. <laughs> cry to your heart's content, but then what? And we are a judgy culture. We are judgy. Like, it's one thing for me to cry because I'm being vulnerable, but you're crying, and that is yeah. a problem for all of us. Or you made a mistake. Or, and so I do think, like, we can say things about our culture, but if we're stigmatizing the people who practice what we're saying, then our culture story isn't true. Absolutely. I, I want to dip into one, like, personal version of this, and... Um, and so I think like we all do work, but obviously we all have lives, hopefully, outside of work. And so sometimes the setback does come in your life, but then you have to deal with it within the context of your work too. And so like for me, a year ago at this time, I was going through some treatments that were hard. I knew I was gonna have a surgery and I'd have two months off. So I was thinking like, great, I planned for two months of no income, figured it all out. What I didn't plan for was six months of feeling like crap before that and and not doing some of the things I probably should have been doing at that time. So that that idea of a setback and also like family members getting sick and things like that. It doesn't have to be it could also be a positive thing like having a child or something like that. But like do you have any thoughts on and when you when you do have those changes, let's say, in your life that are pretty major changes and then how does that link to your work or what do you do you, how do you how do you <laughs> yeah. How do you? <laughs> How do you? How do you? I don't. It's funny because like I, for me. So I've had a couple major life events um, recently. I have a two-year-old daughter. I had a, a kid, and she. That was obviously great, like the highest of highs. Um, and then I lost my brother. Died of an overdose last year around this time, and that was about the lowest of the lows. Like I don't. I don't know if I've ever had my heart ripped out like that before. And vulnerability. Um, but, you know, so the, the thing that I learned from, like, those happening in, in fairly close succession from one another, it, it, so I'm, I'm having a hard time saying this mostly because the thing that I learned is to not wrap things up in a nice little sound bites, but I'm trying to wrap up that lesson in a nice little sound bite. Because the thing is, is it just, the, this thing is just chaotic and ugly and messy and beautiful and all of it happening at once. And so I really, I've really been trying to practice, um, what I think of as a radical compassion for everyone and myself and, and circumstance, even just the whole thing. Like, I, I really do want to greet things as they come um, and, like, 
just watch them go. Because there is this, like, uh, there's a very, there, it's hard to deal with the impermanence of life. And the, the, it seems like it's all, like, just going through your fingertips and you can't grab it. So, like, when my daughter was born, I remember holding her when she was a baby and thinking, like, please, can you just stay a baby forever? Can you just stop right now? Like, just, uh, and of course she didn't. And then, you know, when my brother passed, I'm like, he was uh, hooked up and he was brain dead and we all got to say goodbye and I walked in and I'm talking to him and I'm like, man, he seemed like he was there still and I was like, can you please just come back? Can I like just take you back? Somehow? And there is no grip. There is no grip. And I, I, I know in my heart that when I grip on anything, even something I feel really, I've, had, I've been having a hard time in my head with uh, racists lately, because I'm like, damn, I gotta be compassionate to racists, don't I? I really do, I have to, I can't even hold on to that. And so I, there's all these things that this lesson just hitting me over the head again and again and again, which is like, you have to let go. You just have to keep letting go. And don't try to hold on to anything. And I can't even remember where the question is, but I know that that is the salient lesson for me. It's just don't hold on, don't hold on. That's, that's the, that was the answer to the question. <laughs> I mean, and I, I think, yeah, thanks for sharing the story, first of all. And, and that idea, the, both of those ideas of ra radical compassion and letting it go are great things to sort of keep in mind. Hopefully they'll get more tweets than the uh, tweet that, about the F word that I just said earlier. <laughs> Do you guys have a, another um, example of how you, when there are personal things, how, that, how you deal with that, either in general or with respect to your work? It's all personal, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, there, it, it's, all, it's all personal. It, it, how I feel at home directly impacts how I feel at work. And I think finding, like, I think that work-life balance thing is a joke, but finding balance is just finding space to honor all of it, you know? The chaos and the, the exhaustion and um, the, the, the epiphanies and the relationships, like finding time to honor all of it. Um, so for me, I really, um, I, I know this is going to sound weird, but my safe place is home and finding, you know, I, I feel really grateful to have a partner that I can talk to about even my ugliest self, um, because it doesn't matter uh, how adjusted you are or ho how well you get through your your work day or you know what successes you have like like there's that side that's messy you know that that part of you that's messy and as a leader nobody gives you permission to bring it because they don't want to see it because it somehow undermines what they believe you are but it exists and I think for me it's just being able to have a space where I can be entirely unabashedly you know, unapologetic and myself, um, and 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 be an utter mess, um, and know that I'm going to get up the next day and and go back to work and and everything will be fine. I'm I'm just super grateful for for my family. Yeah, I mean, ditto to all of that, and and I it took me um, a lesson that I, it took me a long time to learn, and that I feel like I'm still learning is is that my desire to create those spaces where people can bring them their whole selves, where people can have failure and come back from it and we can work on that, that, that I, I'm included in that also. <laughs> like I really like making those spaces for other people and then I don't have any problems. Um, or when I do, I, I feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't. And whether that's like in my personal life with my partner, it took me, a uh, while to learn that like actually that's part of being in a healthy relationship and that his um, joy at being the person who gets to see the hot mess version of Laura <laughs> is actually part of our relationship. Um, you and lucky dog. <laughs> <laughs> and that at work, um, you know, the, those systems, like whether, whether that's just the culture and the people or the actual systems of like flexible work time and stuff like that, when I've had really hard personal things to deal with, um, it, it took me a while to learn like, oh, that also means I can take a day off. <laughs> I cannot come to work today. Or that if I am, you know, in the hospital, that this group of people has my back and will catch me and they'll take care of it. And that that's part of um, 
that I get to benefit from that culture that we create too. And unless I do, it's not real. Right. You know, like it, you can have all those great systems and a super cool employee manual, but if I'm modeling that I don't think I can take a day off or I need to be emailing people at one in the morning, then it's not really real for everyone else either. Absolutely. So we have some time for questions now. Does anybody have one? I mean, I have another question, but oh, here. I don't know if there's. Actually, no, wait, wait for the, because otherwise we won't get you on the video. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Doug. Um, so kind of on what Laura was saying there at the end about modeling the culture in yourself, I feel like a lot of the things that are coming up today are about how the general culture doesn't necessarily support some of the things that are being talked about. And so um, while it's very encouraging to see two women who are in charge of places where they can set the culture, I'm wondering also like maybe before that or like if there are ways that you can talk to environments where you don't get to set that and you have to kind of deal with American late capitalist culture. You fix that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, that capitalist culture tells a big, bold story that we are powerless within it. And that is an over, uh, that is a, that is an overpowering message, message that takes away our power in the workplace. And I always, I like to tell people that, um, you know, I get going to a big company or going to an organization and feeling like you can't change anything. So you become one of the cogs and you lose your heart for it and, um, and maybe then you stop bringing your best self to work. And I believe that while you may not be able to change, you know, 3M or, I mean, I'm sure they're lovely if anybody is. <laughs> I, I have a story about sure that. that yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you may not be able to change the culture at 3M, but there are micro cultures and micro environments that can be influenced by people. And if we start making healthy change in those micro environments and we make the people around us feel better, because I honestly believe that culture is not a thing that you can write down, right? You can't, because it's constantly evolving, but you know it because you feel it. Like one of the reasons that we always invite potential clients into our space is because you feel an energy when you walk in the door. And I think that's what we all want from where we go to work. Like we spend our whole lives there and our identities are wrapped up there. And what we want to do is feel good. And we don't want to feel good about our, like we spend so much time in, in our society, like getting desks that rise and fall and, <laughs> You know, like, oh, let's take the walls down because if they're all next to each other talking loudly, they'll feel better. And, oh, wait, the walls are made in... We need walls. People need their own offices. Like, we spend so much time looking at the stuff, but culture isn't a wall or not a wall. Culture is how we feel about each other. Do we trust each other? Do we believe that somebody has our back? Is that a palpable energy? And each one of us contributes to that. But we're looking for somebody else to do it for us. And I think when you start thinking about what can I do to bring that to work what can I do that to make that true in my company and you really hold yourself accountable and you start to have open active conversations about it I really believe you can change culture at work it's gonna take forever but you know what what else have you got to do <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, so this is sort of my wheelhouse after 12 years at 3m <laughs> and actually, no, no, it's, and it's really, actually, it's unusual. Be, I mean, it's really, for me, exciting because there's someone here in the audience who worked with me there. And actually, I think, like, we felt like we could change the culture. And we were really motivated to do that in a lot of different ways. And I think, you know, in small pockets, we definitely, definitely could. And I think some of that, too, for us came through, through how people do the work, right? Like, who's making the decisions? Who's involved in the conversation? I mean, there are a lot of ways that you can do that, actually, if you learn from the organizers around you would apply to some of your organizations. Um, and then, both of us, I think, at different times, we hit a wall, probably, where it was like, I'm tired of being the one trying to like shift something here for the 70,000 other employees around the world. Um, and, and also, what's something that we had sort of texted about this week, which is, you know, I want to go out and create the space that looks like the culture that I want, or is the culture, or looks like the work, how I think work should look, which actually is the space that you're sitting in right now. 
So for me, it was like, these are the values that I want to be. These are the people I want to be in the room. This is, you know, I think the, the, the way things should be is no boundary between work and personal life and some of those things. So I think there is also that, I mean, you all will know for yourself when is the right time or what makes sense for you because there's a lot of trade-offs that go with those decisions. But I do think there is value in going out and creating the spaces that you want to be in. Like, we need more of that. So if that fits for you, I will give you a little extra nudge to say, like, don't be afraid to do that. I also think um, start from a place of not making assumptions that the culture is bad or systems are bad because someone intentionally wants them that way. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times, I mean, I especially in nonprofits, there's like a thousand things people are doing. They think they have to do them. Um, and sometimes it's a matter of just bringing an alternative for how it could be or helping somebody see that they actually have permission to change those things. I mean, um, I guess I have healthcare on my mind today, but I, you know, Springboard, we wanted to provide health benefits to our part-time employees. And we worked with brokers who were like, no, you can't do that. And well, you absolutely can. Um, but there's this sort of ingrained idea that, oh, well, you, you wouldn't want to. So we won't create those systems to allow that to be possible. Um, but there's no like legal reason you can't do that. Um, I, I sometimes say to, to one of my colleagues at work, we can do whatever we want. Um, should we is another question. <laughs> but most things that you can imagine, you can figure out a way to do them and there's so much inertia in how we've built businesses and organizations and systems that sometimes things are easier to change or, or the things that are easy to change are surprising um, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have thought. <laughs> I mean, that's half of my consulting business is being able to ask, why do you do that? <laughs> what else could you be doing? Um, another question? <laughs> so Minnesota. All right, got it, got it, got it, got it. Um, talking about systems and how do we... How do y'all individually buck systems that are already in place? If you're a minority or a woman, how do you find ways, creative ways, that maybe even, maybe even tangible ways that we can all kind of take as a tactic that isn't just pillage and burn stuff down? How do we, yeah, what are some, or just some thoughts around it too? Yeah, I think, is it two part question? <laughs> no, I'll just get, I was talking. Yeah. Like, um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, that, that is the, the, the question, I, th I think, in a lot of ways. Like, we all are really looking for some way to do this. And so, one, I want to say, the, the thing you said about not starting from a position of these places are bad because people want them to be bad. Like, I, the first time I grew out an afro was because I wanted to be like Huey Newton, and I was, like, reading laws and being like, next time I get pulled over, I'm going to roll my, I only have to do a quarter inch. I'm going to do that. I'm going to slide my life. Can't wait. Ooh, I can't wait. And I was just, I was itching for, I saw it everywhere. Every action was racist. Every, and the thing is, is that, like, we, we, uh, America is racist. America is super racist. We, yes, it is. It really is. And it has been for forever. But one, when I stopped looking for it everywhere and just was like, I'm just going to do, I'm going to have my goal and I'm going to just go there and respond to whatever comes my way. So if something hits me and it blocks me, I'm going to, I'm going to just try to get past that and be like, get back, get, uh, it, it, find the way around. Right. And then get past that and then keep going instead of being like, you're racist, you need to do this, you need to da-da-da, whatever. I'm like, and, and what I've found is that I can actually, as a, a person of color, get a lot of power in situations that I just, it, before, wouldn't have allowed myself to actually assume the power. I didn't even realize people were trying to give it to me because I was like, just, just hard, just so hard. Like, I, th this has been one of the major conflicts in my life and one of the major conflicts right now is being hard is politically acceptable. If I stand up and I go, fuck Trump, fuck everyone, fuck this, fuck that, people go, yes, brother, say it again, say it again, say it again, say it again. But if I go, if I'm water, 
that's not going to get retweeted. That's not going to get talked about. But I can squeeze into places that might not want me there. Maybe they do or don't, but I don't care. And so I, I have worked around less so to specific strategies where when I encounter something, I name it and then do that. I've actually kind of come around to the exact opposite to be like, don't worry about whether it's racist or not. No one's surprised here that America is racist and misogynistic. No one's surprised by that. So like, you know, I don't know. I guess it's like this, this, this strategy of softness um, has gotten me way farther. And then once I actually have the power, um, then, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon me to create the spaces that I want to see and actually put my money where my mouth is and find, and to like, and to do it well. But I'm, I'm convinced of the fact that like, if I get into a situation, instead of being like, I need to find, in order to create an equitable situation, I need to go out and find a black person to do this, otherwise I'm betraying my race. Or I need to go out and find a woman because I'm a man, so I need to counterbalance that. If I just look for good people, some of them will be black, some of them will be women, some of them will like to eat badger in their basement secretly. But I don't, like, I just don't care. I don't care what people want to do. Like, fuck who you want to fuck, kiss who you want to kiss, do, do what you want to do, just come build with me. Like, and, and I feel like that has been the most honest, real thing that I've come to in this whole thing and it's actually created a balance in my life that I was looking for before and trying to create. Yeah. Joe, my, my question was for you too. Um, you mentioned that your brother OD last year or earlier this year? Um, in October 16th of last year, yeah. And I was just wondering, because my brother just bat passed not too long ago. And I'm wondering, have you been able to write out of that yet? Yes and no. Like, I've written a lot about it. Um, and nothing worked. Um, but I think, you know, the, I, I like this. Like, there's an old Greek idea about writing, which is that reality is inherently chaotic. It, it is chaos. And that to create a word to attach to something is like reaching into God and bringing down a piece of God and saying like, it's, and it's as simple as like table, to say table. Um, and that idea is really w around my brother's death in particular has been very uh, like operative in my mind where I'm like, his death is so strange to me. It's so weird. I mean, I don't know if you felt that way, but it's just weird. It's just weird. And I'm, and I'm like, it makes me nervous, like the ground is moving weird and, and it, it, like reality kind of turned a little scary and all this stuff. And so I, I have tried really to reach into that like strangeness and pull little things out. And the, the thing I'm left with now is just the act of trying is kind of enough for me right now. I feel like I, I get the sense that like I'm going to have a, one of those dude crying fits here at some point and just like pour it out and it's going to pour out of me. Maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't, but I have sat, I have tried to do it and, and have put words to it in some, some ways. But it's still really amorphous and strange in my mind. It still is. Thank you. And I think I spoke too soon because the sisters didn't get to talk yet about, as women, how do you buck the system? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <I'm sorry>. Elaine. <laughs> um, I didn't have a super smart thing to say. <laughs> But now I feel like we're supposed to say something. I guess what Time to, to speak John's for all women. question, what uh, what helps me is is to be able to telescope between and to be able to hold the idea of the change that I want to see in the racist capitalist patriarchy and what I can do today, and to be able to find those practical. I love practical things. <laughs> um, and so like if, if today what I can do is help an artist do a project uh, in their community or help someone get health insurance or help uh, you know, uh, a community member find their creative practice and, and their creative work, then, then I know that those values are there and that's gonna travel into that bigger system, but I have to be able to telescope that down to like what's possible today without losing sight that, that all the, at some point all those things have to stack up towards the values of the work and the change that I wanna make in the world. Um, but it helps me to be able to have both. I think I can't live in either just the tangible practical stuff or just the big picture. And um, 
it, I mean, I think the most valuable tool I have in my toolbox is competence. Um, we talk a lot about confidence and about showing up and about bringing your whole self and, um, and I think, uh, I think we don't talk enough about just being really fucking good. You know, just being really good, like knowing your stuff. Cause my, you know, my mom, I often reference my mom when I talk about why I have a career. Because my mom was, went to medical school in the 50s and was 4 foot 11 tall and 4 foot 11 around. <laughs> and, um, and in her lab coat, she was a physician, she looked like a pillow. Um, and she used, no kidding, she was the softest, softest doctor you'd ever see. Um, and, uh, and she used to say to me, nobody can take away your education. Get an education. And she wasn't saying go to school and get a traditional education. She was saying, do what you do and do it really well. Because, um, because they're going to, you know, the system is going to undermine you at every turn. And, but if you're really good at what you do, they can't take that away from you. And, and success from being solid in your performance builds on itself. Um, so I think now, in my old age, I'm just old, and I say what I want, you know? Like, I mean, and, and I've said this before on this stage, like, I compromised every which way to get to where I was going. I wore the right shoes, I tried to be a girl, I, um, you know, I tried to say the right things. I tried to show up, you know, like a straight person. Uh, you know, I did all the things I thought I was supposed to do to be a career person. And when I decided, when I, when I built on that competency, when I built confidence that was derived from just being exactly who I am, um, that's when my career took off. And I say it all the time because I think we all lie to ourselves because work tells us we should. You know, and so we show up the way the rest of the world is telling us we should. And I think that's our handicap. And when we all just embrace exactly who we are, we are setting ourselves up for success. And then just being really darn good at what you do. Thank you so much. And that, that I mean, I think that's a great sort of thing about with this conversation. So there's adapting to things that are happening in the world and around you that you, but then there's also this idea about not adapting maybe yourself, right? And, and probably one helps the other, I would guess, as well. So I, I hope that's something that we can kind of all take away as we navigate these different situations about, and this actually, the theme of this year, this Be Unabashedly, Unapologetically Yourself, came from a panel we did last year that Nancy was on, that we got that idea from Prince, but, but it really resonated with a lot of people about like how, and I think a lot of us have found like the more yourself you are, the easier sort of things get or the more you can do. So that is part of uh, today, even though this wasn't a planned conversation, it actually dovetails pretty well. So we're gonna wrap it up with the last question that we've been asking every panelist today, which is, what do you need from the people in the room? A hug. <laughs> Just kidding, do not touch me. Oh <laughs> no, you say, be careful. play those games, you win those prizes. <laughs> Besides the hug yeah. that you don't oh, want? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I guess I need, um, I need for you to show up. Like right now, many of you are sitting here dreaming, looking for inspiration. Your inspiration is what you walk around with every single day. It's that dream. Just do it. Dear God, if I can do it without a Kickstarter or a mom who gave me money or whatever, like anything that you want to do is possible. And there's a billion reasons not to do it. There's a billion reasons and a billion people who will tell you not to do it. Just show up. Because every time, every year I come to Giant Steps, I say, this is the world I want to see. This is the world I want to live in. This is it. That's why I come to this conference. It's the most beautiful conference I've ever seen. Yeah, I kind of along those lines, what I feel like I really, really need um, from this community and from the community here uh, in this place right now is ambition. 
um, and not a talky talky ambition <laughs> where you just talk about what you want to do, but where you really show up and you really push the work forward because that makes that's what I need to make my work better is to be surrounded by awesome people who are making things happen and who are not settling for the small thing um, and who aren't afraid to to push the work to the level of ambition and and be honest about that ambition i think that's that is a um, particular challenge that we have in minnesota uh, we're uncomfortable with ambition and we're uncomfortable with ambitious people especially people who who do step out and say i'm just going to do this i'm not going to wait for permission or for someone to ask me or for someone to give me money um, and i really need more of that in this community uh, because I need it to thrive. So selfishly, I need all of you to succeed. <laughs> it's meant to be kind of a selfish question, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, this is a tough one, because you gotta, gotta backhand it, right? Like, I need a lot of things. Like, I need like 20 bucks, but I can't say that out loud. So, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna backhand. So I, I think that like really what I, what I wanna see, I'll, I'll phrase it like that, like what I really wanna see from people is a, a, a recommitment to the actuality of reality. Like reality as it is, not the way we speak of it. Um, and I'm, I actually really want less politics. I want, I want less discussion around, I mean, at least one, yeah. Like I, I really want less discussion about what people thousands of miles away are doing and I want us to look each other in the eye and be here with one another right now because this is it. It's not what they talk about. This is it, like right now. You're, wherever you are, that's where you are. So that's what I want. All right, thank you. Another round of applause for all three of these folks. Two times, once for stepping in and being really fantastic and the second time for just being really fantastic.